state of Hawaii. If you want to tune in live, we're on Livestream.com. Uh, and if you would like to subscribe and get notifications of our programming, please go to thinktechhawaii.com and sign up. Uh, the theme of our show today, Business in Hawaii, is positive stories, positive guests about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're interested in hearing how people are successful in Hawaii with their businesses despite all the challenges that we've been hearing about. Today, we have a guest, uh, Steve Pengree, who's a prominent attorney in town, and he's beginning to shift his practice more and more into a new area for him, um, <clears throat> and he's going to share some of that with us today. So, welcome, Steve. Thanks, Reg. It's Glad a pleasure to, to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Good to have you. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, give us some background, and uh, tell us where you come from, and how did you get to where you're at today? <laughs> okay. Well, the short, long story is I was born in California and raised there near Silicon Valley, Stanford University area. And uh, after high school, I went into the United States Air Force, having no interest in higher education. Ended up being a medical corpsman for about four years. And then I came out and um, went to college for about a semester. And then I went to Germany, traveled and worked in Germany for a while uh, in a hospital. and. Uh, then uh, came back and sold real estate, got my real estate license in California. And I've been, basically I've had a real estate license for the last 40 years. And it's allowed me to support myself through college over the last 11 years of college. Has that all been in Hawaii or, or other places? No, I went to Foothill Community College up near Stanford University area. And then I moved down to San Diego and went to the University of California at San Diego majored in sociology, then I went to... Sociology major, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and that so, led you right into law. Well, yes, it did. You know, uh, the, I went to law school at California Western School of Law in San Diego, and I uh, was very interested in criminal defense and, you know, basically helping people and so on. Um, I started a legal program for the students at the University of California, and this was back in... Uh, 1969, 1970, 71, when the Vietnam War was going on, and there was a lot of protesting. Um, I remember those times well. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> and coincidentally, uh, students getting busted for marijuana was a big deal mm. at that time. It was happening a lot. And uh, the I created a program where we represented students and bailed them out of jail and and that sort of thing. So you've actually been just even peripherally involved in the marijuana industry for a while. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in that sense, right. And then after law school, I uh, taught college for the Navy, on board Navy ships. The Navy has high school and college programs, and uh, these ships were traveling around the Pacific to Japan and the Philippines and the Indian Ocean, and did that for about a year and a half. And then um, I got on my sailboat and sailed over here to Hawaii. From? San Diego. San Diego. Right. And how big was this sailboat? 30 foot trimaran. And how many people were on this? <laughs> there were four, my brother oh and my gosh. two young ladies <laughs> who didn't know any better, you know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but so I got to Hawaii and I uh, uh, was still teaching college for the Navy, so I'd be traveling a lot, but living on my boat in the Alawai Yacht Harbor, and then I uh, passed the bar and 1976 here in Hawaii and I started my practice and I started out doing criminal defense the traditional shoplifting robbery murder that type of thing Mahalo I also for watching. had a big divorce practice and I did a lot of adoptions which was hmm. a wonderful practice and uh, I did that for about three or four years and kind of burned out quite frankly so I took a year off and went sailing in Mexico and, <laughs> and then I came with, back with the same brother and the no, no 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 <laughs> It was another friend of mine. And then I came back and started uh, my white collar criminal defense practice where I do defend people who are accused of tax evasion, money laundering, bank fraud, Medicare fraud, things of that nature. All dealing with the federal government by and large and the IRS. And I've been doing that for about 35 years now. Well, and I remember that's how you and I first met many years ago, is that we worked together in some of those cases. That's right. Well, we've worked together on many cases, you know, particularly in tax cases where I'm no accountant. I don't know anything about the numbers 
That's I why can, we... I can attest to that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, we did. We worked together, and you would help me out, and we would prepare a defense, and most of the time successfully. Yeah. And uh, along the way, I would venture off into other businesses. Uh, in the mid-'80s, I had a, a wine distribution business to Asia. We were selling California boutique wines to Asia before Asia knew they really wanted to have wine. It was kind of a challenge. So you created the market. We certainly tried. Yeah, and uh, you talk about events that take over beyond your control. Just as we were becoming successful, the U.S. economy strengthened mm -hmm. very much, and it made our uh, wines very expensive all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And basically, we were undercapitalized, something that you counseled against, I'm sure. And um, but then I also had ran a uh, art gallery and a women's boutique. Wow. Uh, as well as practicing law. A very diversified background. Yes, and uh, I've always liked business, businesses, entrepreneur type things, you know. Mostly I like the challenge of doing it, I think. And then uh, along the way, I've always had my real estate interests, and I like to uh, help people buy real estate, usually friends. You know, I don't actually actively practice. Yeah, I don't like doing business with my enemies either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and then in the late 90s I was over in Nevada and I started buying land in a valley outside of Las Vegas about a hundred miles called the Amargosa Valley and the whole idea was that at first just to be a speculator the whole idea was to buy cheap sell high right and then I found out this is a story about how you get involved in something and you never have any anticipation or idea that it's going to end up another way mm -hmm. I thought we were just going to hold the land, but I knew land with water was valuable, so I started buying water rights and transferring well, them over to... Especially in Nevada. Exactly. And, um, and then after about two years, I learned that the Nevada Water Resources Division had a rule that said you have to use your water or you lose your right to your appropriation. That's a holy smokes. <laughs> I don't want to be an alfalfa farmer or a corn farmer. Anyway, I met a fellow who was living in the valley who was a farmer and really knew what he was doing and he said well how about pine trees pine trees pine trees in the middle of the desert in the middle of the desert and that was basically my reaction you know what's a pine tree <laughs> the short story is we started planting pine trees we had at that time about 200 acres on several parcels and we started planting pine trees and and uh, we were growing these pine trees up to 8 15 22 feet yeah, they're evergreen pine trees, not Christmas trees, but uh, similar. And uh, selling them to developers in Las Vegas. And if you recall, before 2008 or 9, Las Vegas was booming. It was. A lot of business. And we were selling a lot of trees. We would dig them up live, deliver them to the site, either a shopping center or a subdivision or a median uh, dividing a highway, something like that. So you truck them down to southern Nevada, to Las Vegas? to Las Vegas, but it's only about 100 miles away, so it's a two-hour truck drive. And then all of a sudden, in uh, roughly the end of 2008, the economy went from an accelerating pace to zero. They caught a cold. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I don't know what you call it on a graph, but it went to zero, you know, and our business was pretty wiped out, so we held on to that uh, land for a long time. And the reason, the relevant reason for this story is now the land, we now have 300 acres of the tree farm company. It's a Nevada LLC. And uh, we have it approved to grow marijuana in Nevada. Wow, interesting. Yeah. And, that's, and so that's how you started to get a little interested in that industry. It was, it began in Nevada. Correct. And this would be Roughly early 2014, Nevada was uh, getting, they had passed a law in 2013, Nevada, the state of Nevada, legalizing medical marijuana and creating a, a dispensary license and then a separate cultivation license and a separate what we call production or extraction mm -hmm. license where you pull out the oils and the tinctures from the marijuana and create products. So it's almost three separate functions Correct. In that industry. Correct. Three separate licenses. Unlike Hawaii, which we can talk about in a minute, which is what they call virtually integrated. You, know, you have one license and you do all three functions. That sounds a little bit more efficient. <laughs> in a way it is. 
in a way it is. It's a, it's a heavier economic burden because it takes, you know, obviously you have to run three separate more components. More capital to get into it. Right? Exactly, exactly. And, and more responsibility in terms of your business plan and, and the number of people you have to hire and, and et cetera. Um, I worked with a company in Nevada, an LLC, then they were going to take part of, we have 43 acres of my land, and they were going to take this land and use it for a cultivation center mm -hmm. and a production center, so extracting the, the oils and tinctures. And so I put together the business plan and all of the necessary components uh, based on the uh, Nevada State medical marijuana rules and regulations, which they already had in place, by the way. How long ago was that, Steve? That was uh, from about April to July, August of 2014. Okay, so you, you've been doing this now for over a couple a year, years. Yeah. yeah, two years. Yeah, yeah. And we, we went ahead and got the approval of the local area, the local city jurisdiction to grow marijuana. They endorsed it. I helped them write their business tax <laughs> while they liked that, you know. And then uh, the county, it's called Nye County, uh, which is outside of Clark County, which is Las Vegas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Nye County has its own approval process called a, a SUP or a special use permit. So we had to go through the planning commission and submit our plans for security and, mm -hmm. and distances and all of the requirements that they had. And we were approved. And then the Nye County Board of Commissioners approved us to grow marijuana in the county. And we were all ready to submit our application to the state. And by the way, these two city and county permits were precursors to a, applying for a state license. You had oh. to do that first. So, so it sounds like it, it, the licensing process has got multiple tiers to it. Correct, in Nevada. Yes, it did. And um, right when we were about, this company was about ready to <clears throat> submit its application, their major investor pulled out. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, really ouch. So, the company had no money to move forward with the uh, with the so application. There you are in that undercapitalized business again. Exactly. <laughs> I'm telling you, I learned a huge lesson about capitalization. I mean, I'm more of the business entrepreneur. Yeah, we can do it. You know, I'll put this together, that together. And I really, I had a partner who was supposed to be the financial guy, but obviously that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned a huge lesson. So basically. Um, you know, came back to Hawaii and was practicing law again and so on. And then when I heard um, uh, that Hawaii was in the process in late 2013, 14, and 15 of creating a medical marijuana dispensary law, you know, my, my interest perked up and I said, I might know a little something about that. I would say so. <laughs> so, because I understand the regulation side of of the government, if you will. I mean, I've been working with the IRS and the federal government for years, and you know how they think. Um, and I knew something about the regulations and how they were structured in Nevada. So I figured, well, I can bring that knowledge and experience here to Hawaii and help some folks who are interested in uh, obtaining a license. So now you're back here. Now I are. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, well, you. and uh, in the second segment of the show, we're going to go into a little bit of what you're doing here uh, locally. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are going to take a, a short break. Uh, we're here with Steve Pengree as, as the guest on Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. And we'll be right back. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it, too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. 
and of course you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. My guest today is Steve Pingree, who's focusing his practice, his law practice currently, uh, in the marijuana industry here in Hawaii. So, Steve, glad to have you here today. Thank you, Reg. Uh, now, we, we, the first segment, we talked a little bit about your background and your experience, uh, what you've done in, on the mainland, uh, and now we're back into Hawaii, and, and now you're focusing on some pretty interesting things here. Right. The, uh, the legislature passed a bill uh, and which ultimately became Act 241, uh, legalizing medical marijuana dispensaries or granting a license system for uh, dispensaries, cultivation, and production sites. Uh, the, this was signed by the governor on July 14th, and the dates are kind of interesting because the regulations haven't been written yet. So the Department of Health is charged with writing all of the regulations that will enable the various sections of the law to be carried out, if you will. Regulations are the rules by which the business has to comply in order to obtain the license. And the, uh, the, the trigger dates are that the applications for the license are due between January 12th and January 29th of 2016. So as we speak, it's roughly five months uh, from now. However, the regulations do not have to be published until January 4th of 2016. Oh, Steve, come on, that's eight days. They've got eight days to figure it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that the Department of Health is working very, very assiduously well, right I'm now sure to, uh, to write these regulations, and uh, we've gotten some positive feedback, uh, such as it is. I mean, the Department of Health is keeping it fairly close to the vest, but you know, they're letting it be known that uh, they're very concerned about the patients, they're very concerned about transparency, mm -hmm. Um, the, I'm rambling a little bit, but the state approval process is going to be what they call merit selection. And the Department of Health has indicated they're going to treat the application process like an RFP, or a request mm. for proposal. And then they're going to have a numerical system that will evaluate certain segments uh, that they feel are necessary. Are they going to share any of that, or is that something that they're going to keep confidential? That's unknown at this point. Uh, we certainly hope that they will be transparent and will share the successful applicants, the names uh, of not only the company, but the principals involved, and their score. And without revealing confidential and proprietary information, they can at least say, we rank them in the area of financial responsibility, so and so. We rank them in security, and this is why, this many points, and that type of thing. Um, again, informal indications are that the, board, the Department of Health is uh, going to be as transparent as they possibly well, can. Well, that would be refreshing. It'll be good to see how that plays out. Well, I know Dr. Dressler, who is obviously the head of the Department of Health, is a very experienced physician and administrator. And She's also a very respected businesswoman in the state. She was the... Uh, previous chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. And mm -hmm. She's been involved in a lot of different uh, business activities around the state, so mm -hmm. she's probably the absolute best person they could have picked for that position. I agree. And although I don't know her personally, I know people who do know her personally, and they s would second your comments. And so that's encouraging. You know, I think she's going to keep a hands-on approach, but there are some um, if you'd like, I can run through the basics of the law to Sure, maybe tell you can uh, just about. summarize it real quickly for us. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's a complicated law, but... Well, and it's still, the regulations are still being fleshed out a little bit, too, so right. you know, okay. we understand. Okay. But basically, the law provides for eight licenses in the state of Hawaii, and they're proportioned three licenses for Oahu, two licenses for Maui, two licenses for the Big Island or Hawaii County, and one license for Kauai. Okay. Each license entitles the licensee to have two dispensary locations, so, and two grow facilities, and two production facilities. Mm. So in essence, there will be 16 dispensaries if everybody decides to build two. They don't have to, but they would be entitled. And they're spread around to the different islands. Correct. As I mentioned, three, right. two, two. Right. 
um, in order to qualify for the license, uh, the state law says that the majority owners of the company right, or the applicant must be 51% owners and they must have been Hawaii residents five years prior to the application. Mm -hmm. So it was an attempt to keep this very, very local. Um, the remaining 49% can be allocated ownership-wise to uh, people who don't live in Hawaii, if you will. And a lot of uh, mainland investors are coming over here and, and investing, I don't know the percentages, but you know somewhere between 10 and 49%. So they're taking a look at it. Very seriously. This is actually, it sounds like this is getting some national attention. I believe so. I believe so. It's a, you know, Hawaii's always been a very exotic place and has had a reputation for years uh, for Maui, you know, well, Maui, Waui, and Kona Gold and all that I sort of thing. We were both in uh, the military at about the same time, and we, we've heard all about that. So. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, it does have a lot of national attention. And the, um, the, focus of the legislature in, in creating this law and passing it has always been on the patient care. Mm. That was that, you know, fi Hawaii basically has had a medical marijuana law for 15 years where patients have been able to grow seven plants in their home or in the home of a caregiver if they had a medical marijuana uh, mm -hmm. card that was prepared or referred by a licensed physician in the state saying that they had a medical need so we've actually had legal marijuana. The problem is that there was no place for the patients to go buy it. And if they didn't have the wherewithal or the know-how to grow it themselves, they were stuck with having to go out on the black market. And, and I would her. imagine that some of that homegrown product would not quite have the same medical impact that some of the current product that we're talking about today. That's absolutely correct. And one of the strong points of this law requires, number one, the state has to contract with a testing lab, you know, a laboratory that will test for, for quantity, for potency, meaning how much THC, how much CBD, I'll explain that in a minute, um, and for contaminants, to make sure that there's no contaminants in there. So every, every licensee will be required to send a portion, a sample portion of their product to this state-approved testing lab to be tested before it can be packaged and marketed. And there's going to be an approval process that, that they get some sort of certification that they've passed these lab tests. Correct. And that will be on the labeling of the product. I think. So the state's very, very concerned that the patients get a medically approved product. And there are, I'm, in fact, I would like to um, read the debil debilitating conditions that would qualify one, if I may. And where, and where is this being read from? There was an excellent article in the Pacific Business News on July 17 of this year, 2015, written by the reporter um, Eleni Gill. And it's a four-page article. She did a lot of excellent research about the economics of the medical marijuana law here. But the debilitating conditions uh, include cancer, glaucoma, uh, HIV, AIDS, um, a wasting syndrome, or it's basically bowel type uh, diseases, post traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Mm -hmm. Hawaii is only one of, I think, 12 or 13 states that actually recognize PTSD as qualifying for medical marijuana treatment. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, just to give you an idea of the other side of it, Colorado recently in the last couple of weeks actually rejected a bill to add PTSD as a debilitating condition. So it's very good for the veterans and other folks who oh, might have PTSD. It doesn't have to be military to have PTSD. Correct, correct. And by the way, uh, the, within the last six months, the federal government has approved um, VA docs to recommend medical marijuana for veterans. Now, wait a minute. I want to make sure I understand this. <laughs> the federal government said it's okay for the VA physicians to recommend or prescribe? Mm hmm Well, they don't prescribe. They recommend they it. They recommend. Right. Okay. Right. Key, key term. Correct. Because marijuana, cannabis, 
better known as marijuana, is under a, a federal Schedule I controlled substance category, the same as heroin, LSD, crystal meth, and therefore is illegal on the federal side. A prescriptive drug would be under what they call Category 2, which would be like Oxycontin and things like that where doctors can prescribe it. So if marijuana were D scheduled, if you will, or dropped down to Schedule 2, then physicians could actually prescribe it. At the current level that it is scheduled at, mm -hmm. doesn't that present a little bit of a challenge for some of these businesses coming into Hawaii to, to do this? It, it presents a huge challenge because still today, on the fact is that marijuana is illegal under federal law. The biggest problem for the businesses is that it keeps or prohibits, it doesn't really prohibit, but it keeps banks from wanting to do business with any medical marijuana facility or even in Colorado and Washington for other states that have recreational marijuana. The banks still will not do business with them because they're afraid of the federal government taking their license away, basically. Well, and that's a legitimate fear, I would imagine. It is. In fact, the, the good news is right now there's a bill before the Senate, the U.S. Senate, uh, called uh, Business Access to Banking marijuana business access to banking. So the Senate's trying to grant some type of legal immunity to banks as long as they're dealing with a marijuana business in a state where it's legal and they are complying with the, with the state laws. I guess without that immunity, most of this business without access to banking product and services would be done in the form of cash. It is. Which sounds a little counterintuitive to trying to, to control some of the bad things that happen when you're dealing in a cash, in cash industry. It, it presents a lot of problems. First one is security. I mean, having hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash in your dispensary business or your... And transporting that and cash. And transporting it, exactly. But the, the business issues that come up is how do you pay your employees? And more specifically, if the government's well, interest, how do you pay your IRS payroll taxes? would love it if they were paid in cash, wouldn't they? Actually, no. <laughs> As you well know, the, the rule is that payroll taxes must be filed electronically. And, and they the, fine you if you don't? Yeah, and it's 10%, if I'm not mistaken. So what happens is these marijuana businesses, they take a big bundle of uh, cash down to the IRS, and they walk up to the door and they have their book work. You know, we paid this much payroll, we owe this much payroll taxes. And then they start putting the cash out on the table, and the IRS takes the cash and then charges the business a 10% penalty wow. because they didn't file electronically. That's a huge problem. And it also goes to why we really need to have some type of banking system available. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got to bring some structure and control to that process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I know we only have a couple minutes left before we go back on break, but it's my understanding that there's also some pretty big tax challenges in this industry as well. Yes, the uh, 280E is a big buzzword in the marijuana business industry. And this is legal or illegal, but essentially the Internal Revenue Code two sec section 280E says that an illegal business may not deduct cost of goods sold from its income. And in other words, what the reason, you may explain that better than I probably what cost of goods sold are, but the, the, the effect is that basically the businesses are taxed at a federal level uh, at almost 100% of their the gross revenues. income, yeah. their revenues, instead of being able to deduct their business expenses. I guess it just boils down to how you define or calculate the cost of goods sold. Well, there have been several court cases, and uh, the IRS, unfortunately, has been prevailing in most of them. But there's a lot of very smart CPAs and tax lawyers that are working on it continuously. So. Sounds like uh, Congress needs to take a look at some immunity for the, uh, the tax situation as well as the banking. Yes. Yes. Very good. Hi. Well, we're, um, we're kind of wrapped up for this uh, segment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a, a short break. This is Business in Hawaii with Steve Pengree, and we're going to be right back. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. 
Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker, and I've got attorney Steve Pengree here, and we're talking about the marijuana industry here in Hawaii. Now, one of the uh, interesting points that we were making uh, or talking about on the break was how this has been gaining popularity uh, throughout the country, that this mm -hmm. industry is starting to get some traction, it's starting to grow. And you've got an interesting little graph here that uh, we might be able to show the, uh, the listeners mm -hmm. today. Sure, I'd be happy to in, in just a moment. The, understand that the legal marijuana industry in the U.S. is something around five years of age. It's an industry in its infancy, has grown tremendously. Uh, excuse me, the uh, increase in gross revenues nationwide has grown about 74% from 2013 to the end of 2014. Those are the latest figures. It's now about a $3 billion industry. 74% in three years, roughly? One year. One year. Yeah. You know, it's what it, whatever it was. See, that, that's how I earn my CPA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, don't claim to be an expert in numbers, but basically in 2013, there was something like $1.3 in gross revenues, and then at the end of 2014, it was closer to $3, point, or 3 wow. billion. So that's a huge increase. It is huge growth. And, and it's, a, it's a business that you might say is in its infancy. The other thing is, one of the biggest stigmas for a small business, or any business, entering into the medical marijuana business is this whole uh, stigma issue of the fact that marijuana is bad or it's a gateway to hard drugs and things of that nature. And um, I think, in my opinion, that stigma is much, much less. In fact, there was a recent uh, poll that was taken a few days ago in New Hampshire and uh, Iowa of registered voters. And generally speaking, over 74% of these who were polled said that the states ought to be left alone by the federal government to run their own legal marijuana programs. And this was Democrats and Republicans. Mm. So the, the, the sentiment is changing tremendously. You never would have gotten this three years ago. So we've got a growing consensus that people are saying, let's, let's leave this alone and let them do their own right, thing. Right. And I brought a chart that shows the United States and it shows which states have recreational marijuana, which states have medical marijuana in them. And if I can hold this up, perhaps you can zoom in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, it, I, don't, I won't go through the entire chart, but the whole concept is a couple of years ago, this chart was almost white. And now you've got 23 states that in some way have uh, either legalized recreational and medical marijuana or at least me medical marijuana. The other thing is right now there are about 16 states in addition to the 23 that have some form of proposal or ballot initiative for 2016 uh, to legalize at least medical marijuana and in some cases to actually legalize recreational marijuana. So if all of this happened in the last few years, where do you see this heading in the next few years? My general statement is in four or five years we're going to see worldwide distribution of Hawaii marijuana. Wow. Wow. And what it depends on, and basically it's the floodgate that will open, is when the United States Congress and the Department of Justice either declassify marijuana in, into a Schedule C or just basically take cannabis out of 
any type of uh, narcotic classification, which will do mean that people can then transport it from state to state. So if we're growing legal marijuana in Hawaii, we could send it to Kansas mm. or Ohio right or Florida. Now, right now, transporting it is a little problematic. It's more than, it's illegal. <laughs> in fact, uh, you cannot transport marijuana, even if it's legally grown in the, in the state, you cannot transport it across the state lines according to the federal law. So once we address this issue, we could be looking at a multi-billion dollar operation comparable to the uh, coffee industry here in Hawaii. Oh, even more, quite frankly. Um, once marijuana is able to be transported, got put on a plane and packaged and sealed and so on to various locations within the United States, then that also opens up the entire world. And there's actually several countries right now that have legal legalized marijuana and more and more are coming online and the beauty of Hawaii marijuana is that Hawaii already has a worldwide recognized brand it does tourism obviously but um, and also Maui Waui and Kona Gold and it will not be any problem at all to sell Hawaii when it's legal to sell Hawaii marijuana in Europe or the Middle East mm -hmm. or, or Asia now, let me, you mentioned something previously that I just want to spend a minute on, and it's the, the image of the industry. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about, the medical marijuana industry today, is not the old Cheech and Chong mm -hmm. type of movie. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. these joints of people. I mean, this is, a, this is medicine. This is medication. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, it's a very controlled environment that is processed uh, and tested by labs. And we have a variety of different types of medicine that's generated from that marijuana plant. And, mm -hmm. and can you just spend a minute and explain all that to, to us? Sure. There's, there's two sections to that. One, the type of people that are being involved in the business. And two, the type of products that are available. So let me address the first, with the personal example. Uh, most, or a lot of people, I should say, although it's a lessening number, think that all people that deal with marijuana are stoners. You know, there are a bunch of tattoos and spikes to, through their eyebrows and things of that nature. And frankly, in April of 2014, I went to a uh, cannabis cup convention in Denver, Colorado. And that's exactly the kind of people that were there. There were about 3,000 people, and they all looked like they'd smoked a lot of marijuana. You know? I think back in the day they called them maybe hippies. Excuse me. <laughs> I resemble that remark. Anyway, uh, yes. But these were people that you know, fit the stereotypical image, you know, and um, the, even the exhibitors, you know, it was mostly they were selling kinds of products that you can find in a head shop. Mm -hmm. okay, so fast forward ahead to November of 2014, there was a huge marijuana convention in Las Vegas, which I attended. I don't think I saw more than 2% of the people there that looked like the stereotypical mm -hmm. uh, marijuana user, you know, what you see in the cartoon books or Cheech and Chong made famous. So these, these new players are a little bit more serious about the game. They were wearing suits and ties. Mm -hmm. And if not, they didn't have a tie on, they had a suit on, were sort of casual like me, you know. Uh, and the exhibitors, where there were probably 150 exhibitors, 20 to 30 percent of them were consulting companies. And the, and the other 20% were investing companies talking about putting investors' money together and, you know, telling marijuana businesses to come pitch us and so on. The point is, it's mainstream business and some very, and it's a young business, mm -hmm. you know, probably under 40 for the majority or under 45. Um, very, very sharp people, risk-taking people, hardworking people. I mean, it's a young person's business. Well, with all the challenges that we've been talking about and mm -hmm. the, the fact that there's a lot of unwritten rules and regulations, it mm -hmm. makes it a little bit risky. But there's also a pretty significant reward mm -hmm. if you're first out of the gate. That's true. Um, for openers, the, there's the cash requirement of having $1.2 million in the, in the bank before you submit your application. Why would they require $1.2 million in cash just to apply for the license? This goes to the legislative intent to benefit the patients. They want to make sure that businesses that apply for these licenses are financially stable mm. because they want the businesses to succeed. So they set the bar high. 
I mean, no other state has that kind of cash. So it's requirement. a filtering process. It is. They want stable, responsible, business savvy people to be running these businesses. That are serious about it. Exactly. Exactly. And the products, um, CNN has done at least three specials with Dr. Sanjay Gupta about Gupta, excuse me, about medical marijuana, and they would be excellent if people want to watch them on YouTube. But basically, there's probably 450 to 1,000 different strains of marijuana. Some have more THC, the psychoactive. 450 different types. Wow, I didn't realize it was that. Right, and, and each strain, when you smoke it or ingest it, um, drink it in a drink or eat it in a brownie or take a pill, um, they have varying percentages of THC, which is the psychoactive ingredient, and CBD, which is the non-psychoactive ingredient. But CBD has been found to be extremely helpful in uh, helping people with debilitating diseases. For example, childhood epilepsy. It has taken children who have been having 100 seizures a day down to one or two, that type of thing. So by combining the, the various percentages in these medically proven uh, ratios in, the, in a marijuana product, you can create a product to work on a specific medical issue. For example, if somebody has trouble sleeping, there's one strain that will help you sleep at night without getting you high. If somebody has uh, PSD, PTSD, there's a strain that works on, it's sort of like um, ambient or something like that. You know? um, and then there are also other strains that deal with cancer pain. There's uh, several strains that are very, very specific for pain, for cancer patients going through chemotherapy and things of that nature. So the goal of the legislature is to have the state administered testing laboratory that will oversee the general quality, but the applicants, when they're running their business, in my opinion, should have some form of in-house testing so that they can, and some type of expertise so that they can create and compound these pharmaceutical well, and, and products. And most manufacturers would have that quality control program internally anyways, even though they may be subject to, say, OSHA oversight or what right. have you. Right. They would have those internal procedures built in. Right. That's true. And understand that's one of the reasons why it's expensive to get into the business. I mean, you know, setting up a lab is not cheap. Okay, so we've got 1.2 million in cash just to make the application, fill out the forms. How much are we talking about? What kind of money are we looking at to start this business? Uh, probably a minimum of three to eight million dollars. And, and this depends a lot on the location of your dispensary and whether you want to lease or buy the property. Uh, the kind of equipment you want in it. Then on the grow facility, they can be shoestring budget, which aren't very good, or you can have a, a very expensive lighting, water, um, sewage mm -hmm. uh, type systems. Uh, they require a lot of power, and that's expensive. Mm -hmm. So, and then you've got your production facility, your extraction. The, the, some of the extraction machines are costing uh, 100 to 200, 300 thousand dollars. Yeah, and then you've got your testing lab, which can be, again, uh, on a sort of a shoestring, but that's still $100,000, I think. So it, it's not just the capital outlay, but you have to consider that you're probably going to have to operate, once the license is approved in um, April of 2016, the business will probably have to operate for a year, year and a half, maybe even two years without showing a profit. Mm. So if an investor thinks they're going to, invest five million dollars and, and within two years they're going to have their ROI or their full investment back, uh, that's probably not going to happen. You're going to have to be a little patient. Right, because first of all, in order to run this organization, you need management, you need consultants, you need accountants, hello, you need lawyers, <laughs> um, and people who are experts in growing and experts in running dispensaries, because nobody in Hawaii has the dispensary running expertise. What does this mean? These are fees. You have to hire employees. If you have two dispensaries, grows, and production facilities, you're probably looking at somewhere around 70-plus employees. Wow. That's payroll. 
And I would imagine part of the application process requires putting together a business plan with some projections. And so if you are doing things on a, a shoestring, it's probably not going to look as good as if you mm -hmm. were showing that you had adequate capital and reserves. That's absolutely correct. Right. You're, you're absolutely right on. Well. Yeah. I wish we could continue the, the conversation. Uh, maybe we'll have a part two later after the rules and regulations are done and we can come back and reflect on, on how things are running. Uh, but we're out of time. Uh, Steve, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, I appreciate uh, you having me. Oh, anytime. And I uh, thank you to the production staff. Thank you to our guests for listening in. And, and hopefully we'll see you all here next week, uh, Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, for Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Aloha.